Greetings and welcome to today's Wilson Center Seminar. My name is Benjamin Gadan. I'm the Deputy Director of our Latin American program. Fighting corruption in Latin America has long been a US priority. Corruption slows economic development for all sorts of reasons. It siphons scarce public resources, produces low quality public services and infrastructure when bribes determine who gets a government contract. It damages the investment climate. It undermines the rule of law and it steals from the poor. Latin America, unfortunately, knows these problems too well. The Americas Barometer has found that nearly one in three Bolivians, Mexicans, Paraguayans, and Peruvians paid a bribe in the last year. Meanwhile, 65% of Latin Americans told the Latino Barometro that corruption is getting worse. And that was before COVID-19, balloon spending on public health and stimulus, and created vast new opportunities for the theft of public funds. Yet over the past four years, the White House and the Department of State have largely abandoned the fight against corruption in Latin America. US-backed anti-corruption platoons in Guatemala and Honduras dissolved. Brazil interrupted its regionally relevant Lavo Jato investigation. And the Peruvian Congress impeached a popular president who had clashed with lawmakers over his ambitious anti-corruption agenda. Happily, throughout this entire troubling period, the US Department of Justice continued its act active role combating drug trafficking, money laundering, and public corruption in Latin America. We've seen a flurry of politically sensitive cases involving Latin American lawbreakers, from the indictment in March of the Venezuelan president, Nicolas Maduro, and close allies for alleged cocaine trafficking, the conviction by a jury in Brooklyn last year of El Chapo Guzman, the Mexican drug kingpin, allegations by federal prosecutors that Honduran President Juan Orlando Hernandez was a co-conspirator in his brother's drug running case and multiple prosecutions under the US Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. More recently, federal prosecutors charged a former Guatemalan finance minister with laundering $10 million, including drug proceeds. And US officials arrested former Mexican defense minister Salvador Cienfuegos on drug trafficking and money laundering charges. He was later released, an issue we'll discuss shortly. To better understand the U.S. national interest in policing high-level misconduct in Latin America and the U.S. role in strengthening the rule of law in this critical region, I'm so glad to welcome two former senior federal prosecutors and a current senior federal prosecutor. They are Daniel Alonso, a partner at Buckley LLP and a former assistant U.S. attorney and chief of the criminal division in the U.S. Attorney's Office for the District, Eastern District of New York, Michael Nadler, a partner at Stumphauser, Foslid, Sloman, Ross, and Kalaya, and a former assistant U.S. attorney in the Southern District of Florida, and Walter Norkin, who's currently an assistant U.S. attorney in the Southern District of Florida. I want to invite you to participate as well in this conversation by sending questions for our panelists by email to lap, L-A-P, at wilsoncenter.org, or on Twitter to at latamprog, that's at L-A-T-A-M-P-R-O-G, again, by email, lap, at wilsoncenter.org, or on Twitter, at L-A-T-A-M-P-R-O-G, LATAMPROG. This event is generously co-sponsored by Stumphauser, Foslid, Sloman, Ross, and Kalia. And I want to thank the firm so much for its generous participation in this event and for loaning Michael's expertise. I want to thank you so much for your interest and participation. I'm going to start our questions today with you, Walter. And I want to ask why the United States, and in particular, your agency, the Department of Justice, prioritizes prosecuting influential Latin Americans and devotes such substantial prosecutorial and investigative resources. I think a question that a lot of people have is, aren't enough Americans committing crimes to take all of your attention um, rather than share it with wrongdoers throughout the Western Hemisphere? Thank you so much for joining us, Walter, and please, the floor is yours. Thank you, my pleasure. And I guess I should stay uh, at the outset, uh, uh, a caveat that I'm speaking in my personal capacity and not as a representative of the US government. Uh, but the question you brings up, that you bring up actually is one that's uh, familiar to me and familiar to anybody who's at DOJ. Uh, the US attorney's offices are divided into 94 districts throughout the country. The great majority of them, uh, and there's two models that they use, but the, the great majority of them subscribe to the model that prosecution should be something that has a local impact. So in other words, if there is a international uh, drug cartel or an international investigation that they are under undertaking, it usually uh, 
it has to tie into something that happens in that district. In other words, a trafficker who is importing uh, cocaine into uh, that particular district, uh, a, a money launderer who is using an account, for example, in that particular district. Uh, and that's the majority of the 94 districts. That, that's what they subscribe to. There's a handful of districts that take a different view. Uh, and it's something that you see in Miami. It's also something that you see in, in Brooklyn and, and in Manhattan. And that is the view that if you go to a higher level trafficker or a higher level money launderer, while you cannot necessarily tie them to something that's happening specifically in your district, uh, the impact is still felt. And the theory is that if you are able to remove a narcotic supplier who operates at a high level, um, that person is probably importing drugs into the United States that get funneled to a variety of places, including the district prosecuting them. Uh, you can say the same thing about a, a money launderer, that if they're um, so heavily involved in, in moving money for bad guys, chances are something that they're doing is impacting that particular district. And that's why you see uh, some of the same districts doing the, these kind of cases. As I mentioned before, there was uh, the two districts in New York, there's Miami, you see it in Washington, DC, you're seeing it uh, in the uh, uh, Southern District of, of California out of, out of San Diego. Uh, it is a little bit of a niche practice. It is a minority of districts that subscribe to this. But the idea is that if you're talking about someone like, like Chapo Guzman, the chances that you're gonna be able to show that he is sending drugs into the United States and those drugs are hitting Des Moines and Dubuque and uh, Duluth and, and those kind of places is pretty slim. But if you look at the DEA statistics, uh, the overwhelming majority of drugs that, that come into the United States, for example, pass through the, the US-Mexico border. And it's not conceivable that that giant quantity of drugs is gonna stay along the border. It gets filtered out to these other districts. And so that's the, the view of the few districts who, who practice in this kind of area and, and why they do these cases. It is a conscious decision uh, to go after some of these higher level players that have an impact that is perhaps broader than just the district. Uh, but that is uh, to come back to your original question, hence those prosecutions and, and uh, you know, more informally, this is why we care, so to speak. And we've been talking a lot already, and, and when we discuss federal interest in, in criminality in Latin America, about drug trafficking cases and, and high-level money laundering often associated with drug trafficking. You know, you can think of the kinds of political elites that we often target, for example, members of the Rosenthal family in Honduras. But in many ways, it's the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act cases that are the bread and butter of our efforts to fight corruption in Latin America. And those cases typically involve private sector actors, both obviously United States private sector actors and companies within the region. I'm interested, and I know you track this closely, in the evolution of the DOJ's use of this tool you know, over a long time period, but in particular over the last several years when, as I mentioned, other parts of the US government had really taken their eye off the ball when it comes to fighting corruption in this region. Well, you know, unfortunately, sometimes, uh, you know, high level corruption in Latin America does go hand in hand with narcotics trafficking. So it's no, uh, it's no shock that some of the highest level people that have ever been indicted like Maduro and Cienfuegos and going way back to Noriega from years ago, um, you know, had to do with the drug trade. But if you're talking about specifically uh, enforcement of anti-corruption laws, particularly the, the main transnational corruption law in the US, the FCPA. Uh, yeah, I have I have been observing that for a while. Obviously it's been around since 1977, uh, but, it, but it really you know, jumped into high gear in the mid 2000s, uh, maybe early in terms, of, uh, in terms of really being enforced in a, in a serious way. But what's happened in recent years is kind of interesting. So the FCPA, for those of you who don't know, punishes the payment of something of value to government officials in foreign countries in order to obtain or retain business. And, and the people that are subject to it are U.S. companies and U.S. people and also uh, issuers, people who issue stock or, or other types of securities on the U.S. market. So the, so the payers are the ones that are subject to the FCPA. The FCPA does not criminalize 
the recipient of a bribe. So if Cienfuegos, instead of having been accused of, of drug crimes, had been accused of taking bribes, that would not have been an FCPA case. There are other U.S. laws that can work, depending on whether we can otherwise obtain jurisdiction, that, that, that could work uh, against bribe recipients, but not the FCPA. What's very interesting is that the Obama administration in 2014 came up with the U.S. Global Anti-Corruption Agenda. That's what they called it at the time. And what was very interesting about it was, uh, other than just, you know, a, a reaffirming of the commitment to enforce the FCPA, it actually said that the US, U.S. foreign policy aims to change behavior of foreign officials in other countries. So the U.S. is trying, by enforcing the FCPA and other laws, uh, is trying to change behavior, kind of clean up uh, other countries, which is kind of a groundbreaking thing for the U.S. to have uh, official policy to reduce public corruption in other countries. Uh, and to, to justify that, you know, sort of to go back to your original question, Benjamin, about, you know, why does the U.S. care? The U.S. justified this uh, by uh, the Obama administration saying that pervasive corruption siphons revenue away from the public budget and undermines the rule of law and confidence of citizens in their governments and facilitates human rights abuses and organized crime and at bottom empowers authoritarian rulers. So basically, the U.S. was saying then, and I'll, I'll get to why this is relevant now, the U.S. was saying then that this is important to U.S. national security to combat public corruption in other countries. And why this is important now is that the Trump administration never rescinded this. Uh, you know, unlike President Obama and a lot of his appointees, the Trump administration has not been as strong in its public statements, but it's never been rescinded. And obviously, we're now uh, theoretically heading into an, a new administration. Uh, and, and what's interesting is that, you know, for people who have said or people thought that the Trump administration might go a little easy on FCPA enforcement, that hasn't really panned out. While there have been maybe fewer cases this year, fewer settlements, the two largest settlements in history came out this year, one Airbus and one Goldman Sachs, uh, the two largest FCPA settlements ever, uh, the latter one being more than $3 billion. So, so notwithstanding its, its lack of interest in this rhetoric that the Obama administration embraced, the Trump's uh, folks have actually put forward serious cases, and there's every reason to expect that a Biden administration would continue uh, this trend. And Dan, quickly, can I ask you to speculate on, on that disconnect? I mean, there was this expectation that the Trump administration might consider this an uneven playing field, putting U.S. firms at a disadvantage for not being permitted to pay the sorts of bribes that maybe their, their competitors from other markets do pay. And yet, as you've pointed out, these prosecutions have continued. Can you speculate as to why? I mean, is this just a question of the independence of these U.S. attorneys? Well, it's not, it's not U.S. attorneys that, that drive the, the, the ship, steer the ship in terms of FCPA. It's the fraud section. Uh, but of course, they work with U.S. attorneys, and U.S. attorneys are very involved in, in FCPA cases. But Maine Justice really does deal with them, and it, it gets personal interest from Trump appointees uh, in Washington. So, you know, what, what led to the speculation is that the president himself had said things early on, I think before he was president, and maybe even during his presidency about how unfair it can be. But, uh, but really, it, it just hasn't panned out. And there are still investigations in the pipeline. Uh, and and I, I, just, I just think that for whatever, for whatever reason, they, there is an independent, as Walter said, an independent uh, bureaucracy within Maine justice that can be interfered with in individual cases, as we've obviously seen in, in some high profile news reports over the last year. But, as a, but by and large, the machinery of the Department of Justice proceeds relatively apolitically. Um, and, and in this area, it's proceeded. By the way, I will say that there has been some, you know, some slight uh, cutting of slack to companies, as you would expect, probably in any Republican administration, but certainly in this one. So, for example, there have been fewer monitorships. That's by policy. Um, there is a more lenient uh, uh, policy for self-disclosure, an FCPA policy that gives quite a bit of leniency if the if corporations are bringing the offense to the attention of the Justice Department. Uh, and so these things are, you know, perhaps a little bit more corporate friendly, but they show no slowdown in the actual enforcement of the transnational corruption law. Thank you, Dan. Michael, we've been talking broadly about 
prosecutions as supporting the strengthening of the rule of law in Latin America. And it, it's quite fragile and in fact worsening in many places. But you know, as you know very well, that's not the only way the United States contributes to strengthening criminal justice systems in Latin America. I can think of a variety of technical assistance, particularly OPDAT, the Office of Overseas Prosecutorial Development, assistance and training. My question for you, Michael, is what are the other ways that the United States shows an interest, as, as both Dan and Walter have described, in improving the rule of law in Latin America? Thank you. So OPDAT is probably by far the strongest partnership we have with the State Department, which sends prosecutors overseas to provide a tutorial in various areas to strengthen the rule of law, to give foreign jurisdictions an understanding of how we operate within the United States, how we apply our laws and our investigations that may help or assist overseas. I think the other strongest partnership and attempt we have to provide foreign jurisdictions with a glimpse into how the US prosecution works is by providing or having foreign law enforcement or US law enforcement officers stationed at foreign embassies and working in very strong partnership with the local law enforcement on the ground. We probably have US law enforcement, whether it's Homeland, FBI, DEA, various law enforcement agencies and almost every embassy. And even part of our job as line at USAs is to develop those relationships because when you're talking about, like Walter, the transnational uh, narcotics or the FCPA like Dan, these incorporate massive amounts of jurisdictional information, whether you have Swiss banks you have to start dealing with or Portuguese banks. There are so many different foreign investigations going on as well that those relationships become critical because the exchange of information now that we live in such a global world for the movement of the money, which is the proceeds of, in the cases of the selling of narcotics or the corruption. And in part, for example, the influx of that money into the Southern District of Florida was in probably part of the reason there was such an impetus to start focusing on these cases. Real estate goes up. There's a cascading series of events that happen with each jurisdiction. Drugs is the obvious, right? The more drugs these companies, these individuals, import or export into the US, it affects our affects so many different parts of our society. The same with the movement of money. So as our cases get larger and we're focusing on some bigger targets, the scope of these investigations are, are huge and having law enforcement officers develop those relationships becomes critical. I want to ask about the balance of those kind of relationships you're describing. So in country, you know, based at our Embassies. You've got representatives from DOJ and, and from various DHS elements. Um, how much of that is chasing particular bad guys, gathering info for a prosecution that, that someone like you might have been working on versus the kind of capacity building that we hear the State Department emphasize, the kind of training and vetting um, of local law enforcement counterparts so that they can do some of this work on their own? I think each side is, is significant. Of course, the individual agents in these countries is the support role for the investigations that are developed in the U.S. that may touch these countries. But a large part of their daily work is to develop the internal relationships within the country city that they're in. There might be, for example, you know, a Swiss investigation that's going on that may touch through the course of the investigation, another U.S. investigation in Miami, New York, or Brooklyn or wherever, and putting those people to together and de developing those relationships, as well as developing, you know, boots on the ground, having the prosecutor from Miami meet the prosecutor from Switzerland. So there's more of an open dialogue, because the process for us, as or when we were when I was a line prosecutor to get foreign information, can be tedious. It's it's you have an MLAT, the process can be long. Some jurisdictions provide additional steps. So being able to have those boots on the ground, both to assist and support the US as well as develop the relationship becomes important. Dan, I promised that we would get back to Cienfuegos. I know a lot of people who are watching this are very curious about it. Perhaps that's why they're here in the first place. So I don't want to put it off for too long. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna task you with helping to explain what went on. Just the basics, Salvador Cienfuegos, the former Mexican defense minister, arrested in what was a very surprising 
um, development um, in the United States. He had been someone who obviously collaborated closely with the United States on counter-narcotics work. We have, over the last few years, developed very close relationships with our Mexican counterparts. He was known, apparently, as the godfather, um, allegedly sitting on top of this pyramid that involved the military, but also uh, you know, extremely violent Mexican cartel going after its rivals, but protecting um, this individual's alleged allies in the criminal underworld. Um, but now he has seen the charges dropped. He um, will no longer be prosecuted in the United States. What happened, Dan? Well, uh, first of all, just the, part of your background, this is a great example of this combination of drug trafficking and serious corruption. Obviously, that's it doesn't get much more serious than this. So what happened from a purely legal point of view is that the government filed an indictment and then moved to dismiss the indictment and the court dismissed it, which the court will do 999 times out of 1,000 if the government requests it. So what was unusual about this, obviously, is that uh, it was clearly done for political purposes. It's it's very rare that prosecutions, you know, the, the basic basics of being a prosecutor is you're not supposed to allow political considerations to enter into the prosecution of any given matter. And that, by and large, happens in the Justice Department in the day-to-day -day cases. They're not influenced by politics. Uh, and even, even when they come to the attention of high level officials, they're very rarely still influenced by politics. This here though is foreign policy that appears to have influenced this. So we have a situation where according both to the letter that the US attorney filed in the Eastern District of New York um, and some reporting that the New York Times did, um, first of all, the government stands by its evidence, right? The case is still strong according to the US attorney. So that's really unusual. An indictment should not be dismissed if, it if it's supported by strong evidence. But here, the government is citing countervailing po foreign policy considerations, which it did not spell out, but which the New York Times reported had to do with an actual threat by Mexico to expel DEA agents of the type that Michael was saying uh, are assigned to embassies and can be very, very useful. I mean, apparently, the, the uh, Lopez Obrador government, which is very strong in its rhetoric against corruption, did not like the fact that the US had filed major charges against one of its former high level officials. And so they got pretty upset. There was obviously negotiation with the State Department. Maybe it went even higher than that. We obviously don't know. But clearly, the Justice Department made a decision to dismiss the case because it was told to by the political forces, you know, higher than higher than them. Uh, the U.S. attorney explicitly said that and, and said they stand by the uh, the ruling. I will the, the evidence. I will say that it's unusual that the U.S. attorney himself, the acting U.S. attorney, because there's no confirmed U.S. attorney in Brooklyn, but the acting U.S. attorney uh, was the person who signed the documents. Uh, I would imagine, but I don't know that if I were the line assistant U.S. attorney who had been working on that matter for several years, I'd probably be furious uh, about that instance and probably would say I'm not signing it. So that would be my, my guess as to why Seth Ducharme signed that as opposed to the assistant U.S. attorneys in charge of the case. And you've mentioned that the Mexican government was not pleased by this. The reporting on the displeasure in Mexico City wasn't limited only to the target, but this alleged lack of cooperation, that this came as a surprise to senior Mexican officials and that that was improper given the closeness of the law enforcement yeah. relationship. Yeah, that's a great point. What Michael said is spot on. I'd love to hear what he thinks about this. The, the cooperation among law enforcement agencies in different countries has been a, a revolutionary in the last 10, 15 years in all areas. It had been going back 30 years in drugs, but uh, but it's been really great in the, in the last 5, 10, 15 years. Um, and I think the Mexicans probably grew to uh, expect that. And I think the Americans were pretty happy to give it unless they thought there was some reason not to. And reading between the lines, this was so high level and so corrupt that they probably didn't want to uh, you know, tip off anybody that they that they were doing this. They they arrested him on a trip to the U.S. So you know th these things are very very delicate. Uh, so but that that's a little bit speculation. But uh, but 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 I'm not surprised the Mexicans are pissed. I, I'm also not shocked that the U.S. wouldn't have told them about something like this when they wanted to arrest him in the U.S. and avoid extradition proceedings, which probably would have never happened. Absolutely.
Absolutely. Michael, I mean, this brings up, I mean, this is interesting on its own. We definitely want you to, to weigh in. But it also brings up this broader question of how governments in Latin America and elsewhere view the DOJ's role in the region. You know, I'm discussing it as almost a form of foreign assistance, that we're there to help, you know, build the rule of law. I have to imagine that this reaction in Mexico is not the only time that DOJ action has provoked some discomfort in the halls of power in Latin America when we've gone after, you know, current or, or former very senior and well-connected figures. So, uh, as everybody's going to say, this is all pure speculation. We can look into what's out there and try to read between the lines. I think there's a lot going on. Normally, our relationships that we've built with Central and South America, Mexico and Colombia in particular, have grown so strong over the years. Those are some of our strongest partnerships, that something like this probably would have been a significant discussion whether or not to notify. And, and I agree with Dan, given the fact that they were hoping to arrest him once he came to the United States so he wouldn't be advised that there was going to arrest, probably the communication didn't occur. That's, that's what I would think. The other thing is you have to also look at on the other side of what's going on here. You have a populist president. You have a populist in Mexico who is not a fan uh, of the current administration that normally we probably would have taken for granted that something like this, like which happens in many other countries, they would have been okay with it. It's rare that we take this kind of hugely political prosecution and there's a lot of blowback. Usually there's some consideration. On the line, you know, we look at the facts, we look at the crimes committed and, and we go from there. We advise and notify our superiors and expect them to have the more detailed conversation. I, I, I can totally sympathize as a, always been a not line at USA and not had to necessarily consider the larger ramifications of my prosecution. It would have been a blow for someone to say, well, there's a political reason why the case you spent, probably a case like this, a year, you know, efforts has to be dismissed, not because we're saying you didn't do your job, but because there's politics involved. But again, as a line you would say, that doesn't really come into our factor. We expect there to be no politics when charging a crime. Um, in, in a larger scheme, when you take that away, the emotion that we put into these investigations, I can totally see the rationale behind something like this. Mexico is a strong partnership, although the immediate reaction was support the populace in Mexico did not like this prosecution. And I think that supported and influenced the kind of response the U.S. eventually got from AMLO, from that president. Yeah, what I see what you I was, wanted to wait. Go what ahead. What I was going to say, Benjamin, if I can, Please. just this goes back to national security, though, right? So, I mean, those, those line AUSAs, I'm sure, are upset. But this is not that different from what the Obama administration was saying about foreign corruption enforcement. You know, there are there can be concerns that override rarely. It's got to be rare, but there can be concerns that override our internal justice system on very rare occasion. And here it was th those DEA agents and the cooperation of Mexico does affect our national security. And uh, and, and you know, same thing with the um, with the Obama global corruption initiative. And I presume, I, I presume I would just say, and Walter, I'm going to go to you next, um, although I won't, won't ask about Cienfuegos specifically, but I can't imagine, you know, this is the only time it happens. It's rare that it happens after an indictment, but probably there are indictments that are never pursued for the kinds of reasons that may have played a role here. Walter, my question for you, and, and please weigh in on any relevant angle is, you know, what are the interagency dynamics that go into the cases with these foreign policy implications? Because I think there's a real complexity to these issues that you wouldn't find in lots of assistant U.S. attorney prosecutions and indictments. Here, there's a lot of factors where the State Department and the National Security Council are going to have some strong opinions. And, you know, folks like you are going to face some interagency dynamics that are different than a lot of your, your peers. And uh, thank you for, for asking. And I, I'll, I'll say this kind of dovetails with a point that I was going to make uh, to Dan's and uh, Mike's point. Um, there, there is speculation that the line assistants feel a certain way and then management feels a different way. Um, that's not necessarily the case. Uh, and I'm not speaking uh, as if I have any kind of inside knowledge of this, but I, I can tell you that um, 
there's there's all kinds of reasons for why things unfold the way they do. There, it's it's hard to know what were the variables that went into it. Um, remember also, uh, there could be changes in public opinion, or could, there could be changes uh, in the political world of the foreign country from the time when an indictment happens to when an arrest happens. There could be changes even from when the arrest happens to three days later when. Uh, newspapers and, and public uh, are, are weighing in. Uh, and I can tell you, I've, I've certainly had cases where uh, you think you have foreign support or, or a certain level of foreign support and then it switches. And sometimes you're surprised that uh, you thought you were gonna have resistance and you get the, the positive of the, the foreign support is stronger than you expected. And sometimes it's the opposite where you're talking to foreign counterparts and it, and it sounds like they are supporting what you are doing. The result comes out and all of a sudden people aren't so thrilled with with how things unfolded depending on the charges depending on the, how the arrest happened depending on on all kinds of things so that's that's the only cautionary point i'd say about uh you know dan and mike uh speculating about how line assistants feel versus the the administration uh or or higher level uh managers there may not be any daylight uh in between how they feel uh and i can tell you i guess going more to the original question you asked I'm a line assistant now, but I've also been a supervisor. I was a chief of uh, the narcotics section in the Eastern District of New York at one point. And so I've kind of seen both of the perspectives. Uh, it, it is one of those things that's hard for people who are outside of government to understand that it sounds like the United States is one government, um, and it is, but it's also not. You have every department that has its own uh, perspective on things, and, and sometimes uh, it happens that they're they're working at cross purposes because the Department of State has a certain mission, or Treasury has a certain mission, and DOJ uh, has one that's that's different. Uh, I, I can tell you, and and this is uh, you know coming back to the daylight between prosecutors and uh, managers in the office. There's always a give and take uh, between what DOJ wants to do in an ideal situation and what happens when there are implications that involve other departments. Uh, it's, it, there's not a chain of command where someone tells DOJ, you know, state tells DOJ, don't indict uh, or dismiss or something like that. Those are very much decisions made within DOJ, uh, but certainly uh, as a professional courtesy that you would expect among colleagues, among people in, in the same government, uh, there is attention paid. And if it's possible to uh, acquiesce, if it's possible to make things be better, to, to smooth things over with other departments, certainly uh, DOJ does that. But DOJ also does uh, um, takes its own path when it's when it's not possible. And there's not a system, uh, there's not a checklist that says, for example, before indictment or before prosecution, you must get approval from. The country attaches, or DOJ, or or state, or or anything like that. Um, but every prosecutor who operates in this arena knows that the smart thing to do is to read in and get the okay from as many people as as possible, because you don't want it coming back to uh, to harm your case later on. And that's something that's certainly discussed with line assistants as as they. Uh, investigate and, and the case proceeds up the chain within DOJ to charging decisions. Um, so it's uh, th there's you know there's there's not a set system in place, but it is one of those things that's expected. It's 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 something that uh, if you look at the model of what's the best way to do it, it's always with with consultation. It's just not possible in every situation to make everybody happy to make every agency happy. Let me remind everyone that you can continue to send your questions by email to LAP, that's L-A-P for Latin American Program, at wilsoncenter.org, or you can reach out to us on Twitter at LATAMPROG, that's L-A-T-A-M-P-R-O-G, um, and please continue to, to participate in this conversation. Walter, I'm going to stick with you for a minute with the, the question that we got about the use or abuse of anti-corruption investigations in Latin America and how the U.S. might be occasionally drawn in. Um, there was a letter from members of Congress alluding to the, the prosecution investigation of a former Brazilian president, President Lula, um, alleging that in Brazil this was politically motivated and that the United States, by participating in the broader Odebrecht investigations, may have been you know, colluding with a politicized effort. You don't need to weigh in particularly on Odebrecht if you don't want to, but this question of 
corruption investigations wielded as a partisan tool in Latin America and whether DOJ can somehow get ensnared on occasion in, in those politicized investigations. It's, it's certainly possible and it is certainly something that we look out for. Uh, it's, it's a consideration. Um, anytime you're, you're charging something where you, you think there's gonna be a political angle to it, it's, it's something you have to think about. Um, this, this, by the way, is, is not new, right? In the sense that if, and I'll, I'll go back to before my time so that I can't be accused of, of talking about a certain administration or, or anything that, that I've done or anything that I know about. But um, if, if you read articles about kind of the, the rise of the Mexican cartels, uh, it seems that there were times where one administration or another was fighting a particular cartel, but was in fact, even though they were making progress against that political, uh, against that cartel, helping out a rival cartel. And then the politics would change and all of a sudden they'd go after a different cartel. Uh, and the accusation is, well, by going after that new cartel, you're, you're helping out another one, a, an old one or one that's rising. And so the, these kind of considerations always play a factor. Uh, in, in some instances, DOJ has specific rules about it, for example, you know, not charging things before an election or, or something like that, where what you do can influence uh, what happens in that foreign country. But in other, you, you can't write a rule for every possible case out there. Uh, you just have to train the prosecutors to kind of use their spidey sense as well enough and, and think about it um, all the way down to the line assistant, by the way. This, this is not, certainly I'm sure managers think about it, but any, any good line assistant is gonna think about it too and, and think about whether if they're being drawn into this, yes, there is evidence to charge, but there's also prosecutorial discretion. And is this the right thing to do when all things are considered, not just, can I make the case? Michael, you, you've worked on a lot of Venezuela cases out of South Florida. You know, I've alluded to potentially politicized investigations in Latin America. In the United States, it seems hardly coincidental that the increased focus from a foreign policy standpoint on regime change in Venezuela, on a democratic transition, has been highly correlated with an increase in investigations and prosecutions in the United States by federal prosecutors of regime elites, uh, members of the government. Uh, can you tell me a bit about how sort of a presidential and foreign policy priority could bleed into the priorities of, of the US attorneys? Right, so it's the proverbial cart before the horse, which came first in this case. Um, I can tell you, at least my experiences don't really lead into pressure, right? The cases and the money laundering, the corruption that resulted and came from what was going on in Venezuela was really the impetus. There happens to be a marriage in this particular case of Venezuela not being a strategic partner or any diplomatic relations. So there was no discouragement, no encouragement, by the, I guess the process, you knew that people were looking at you, that it is a topic of conversation. 99% of the time, the foreign corruption cases, whether it's FCPA or narcotics, are going to be supported by our strategic partnership. Venezuela is one of the few, and most of the other Latin American countries have started to get more of a relationship, formed back into a relationship with the US. Venezuela is the exception. Uh, Venezuela, the cases were developed really not because there was pressure or suggestion from the Department of Justice, the White House, but the fact that Miami became a hub for a lot of Venezuelan nationals who were leaving that area to develop at least some basis in the U.S. They bought apartments, they moved their accounts, they set up a, a place to stay here. And that's what really encouraged and began the the majority of these investigations, we started to see so much money move through South Florida related to these types of cases. Um, even when the politics in the case of Venezuela, because there's a divergent of diplomatic relations, you had, especially when the Guaido regime, you had a number of open source articles coming out saying that some of the individuals who were being charged were trying to tap into their support of Guaido as a means or method to avoid prosecution or indictments here. I can tell you it's the exact opposite. The department, kind of my understanding is, stood independently and said, these two things are separate. You can maybe get credit on, on, on the end 
for your substantial cooperation, but we're not going to excuse your crime simply because you have a similar foreign policy we do to your home country. And I want to talk to you about excusing crimes and foreign policy and, and DOJ prosecutions. I'm sticking with Venezuela here, and the question relates to the Cienfuegos decision in a way, which is that sometimes for foreign policy purposes, we will drop an indictment, maybe even there could be a pardon. We see spy swaps historically that have been used for foreign policy purposes, even when people have indisputably committed federal offenses. My question for you is when we, and, and you know, I've written about this subject, when we talk about aiding the Venezuelan negotiations between the regime and its opposition, we often talk about trading US sanctions in return for concessions. We rarely hear about trading indictments. I know this is not a topic DOJ, thrives on um, or, or seeks out. But but I do want to ask, I mean, from the example we've seen of Cienfuegos, do you imagine that at some point a Biden administration, for example, might consider some of the indictments as tradable? Well, I know you've written about this, and <clears throat> I, I do think that we, we have to be realistic about it. I, I think that it is uh, to use a technical legal term, icky to trade indictments for foreign policy advantage. But at the end of the day, the most important thing to the country is its national security. And so uh, I'll reiterate what I said before, that it has to be really rare. Uh, but on occasion, uh, I do think that it, I mean, the spy swap is the best example, and that's been used forever. But, uh, but on occasion, you could imagine if that were the if that were the way to pave the way to a democratic Venezuela and to advance US interests in the region, I mean, th that probably is, is a relatively uh, small price to pay. The, the problem comes with, if you start doing this too much, you, you, know, you start to create expectations that the US is willing to deal political cards. Uh, I've already heard from friends who are uh, defense lawyers, US defense lawyers who have cases down there, after Cienfuegos, their clients have said, well, why don't you have that kind of juice? How come you can't get my case uh, dismissed? And uh, you know, obviously that, that's, it's apples and oranges, but you start doing it too much and, and you start to create an expectation. So I would, I would say that if, if we're gonna make a policy about this, there should be a very, very strong presumption against, but in extraordinary circumstances for real US national security reasons, it, it, it can be on the table. And briefly, Dan, I mean, of the other potential negative consequences, this seemed to have come up in the Huawei extradition uh, proceedings with Canada, where there's been a question if this is politicized or if it could be traded in that case for some kind of commercial gains for the United States, then this would maybe complicate the efforts from the Canadian standpoint or any other partner in you know, extraditing an individual to the United States. Is that something you think is sort of broadly complicating? Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm less, I'm less impressed by commercial advantage than I am by national security advantage. Now, some might say when you're talking about China, those two things go hand in hand, but, uh, but no, I really mean this should be extraordinary circumstances only. Walter, we have a question about asset freezes, asset forfeiture, you know, largely in the US, some of the, maybe the real estate that Michael has referred to in South Florida, but also assets in other jurisdictions. Can you talk a bit about the use of that tool as a way to achieve some of these goals, the complications logistically or otherwise, but also the importance again of whether this is freezing assets after a drug kingpin designation or civil asset forfeiture. So talk about getting the, the actual assets, the goods of some of these wrongdoers, even if we can't put them in a federal prison. Uh, it's it's certainly an important component uh, of justice, and it's an important component of um, bringing uh, wrongdoers to, to justice because people aren't uh, engaged in narcotics trafficking for the thrill of it. They're looking to get a financial benefit at the end of the day. Uh, and there's a funny story. Um, I don't know about a story, uh, an adage, right, it's about if what's the way to hurt a drug trafficker most it's not to seize a load of cocaine as it's in a boat on the way to the US. It's if you can seize the money before it goes back because you force the drug trafficker to expend all this money to take all these risks in sending drugs north and you've heard them, you, you've heard them where it counts the most, so to speak. And so the, the financial aspect is supremely important as far as uh, punishment as far as deterrence, making an impact, uh, rooting out drug trafficking, rooting out corruption and, and money laundering. It, it's unfortunately one of those things that's often easier said than done. 
if there are assets in the United States that we can freeze or seize, um, we have a lot of tools to do that, but it's a lucky instance where you have the assets in the United States. More often than not, the assets are abroad, and then you're dealing with kind of a, a web of memorandums of understanding that are bilateral agreements between the countries about what can be done, what can be seized, uh, the sharing of assets. Um, the, the good thing is uh, very often the, the foreign countries also have an incentive to participate in this because uh, they're interested in, in getting the, the assets themselves. And so you are able to uh, do something. Um, but you know, the more sophisticated a, a bad guy is, the more sophisticated they're going to have the scheme to hide their money. And so unfortunately, uh, on some level, if you can't seize the assets, it, it becomes a weighing of, is the crime worth it? Can, can I do 10 years in the United States and then come out, go back to a foreign country and enjoy the fruits of my labor? Um, so we really do try to take that incentive away whenever we can. It's just not always easy to accomplish. Have you been surprised though with DOJ's ability to discover assets even among sort of some sophisticated criminal actors who you would think would have known better from having assets in the US? I'm thinking in particular of the former Venezuelan vice president, a sitting vice president at the time, Tariq Kalasimi, who when DOJ, you know, when he was designated a major drug kingpin through sort of a clever identification of his bag man in the United States, DOJ was able to freeze a variety of assets, multi-million dollar condos, I think maybe a plane in Florida as well. Um, has that been a way to get around that problem, to, to identify some of these lesser known associates and freeze their assets as well? Yes, it's, it's certainly been a way, and I have to applaud Treasury in particular and, and OFAC. Uh, they're, they're better than what I've seen in almost any law enforcement agency of being able to, to trace that and to identify that and put together the intelligence. Uh, I mean, remember, DOJ is as powerful as it, as it is, uh, we are limited in some circumstances because we gather evidence that at the end of the day has to see the light of day. It has to be presented in court. You have to be able to present it to a judge. Uh, it can be attacked by the other side. And a lot of uh, our, our counterparts, whether it's treasury or, or, or foreign law enforcement, uh, they don't have the same kind of restrictions. Uh, obviously, you have to be careful with, with using that because the complaint I do hear about uh, from, from people on the other side is it's a little bit of a black box and there's no way to, to challenge the, the due process of, of things. Uh, and I, I think the, you know, their, their point is taken, um, but by the same token, uh, whenever the Department of Justice can identify something and, and their counterparts can identify something, um, I've, I've been surprised uh, for sure with, with how successful that's been. Um, I wish it were more successful, uh, but uh, I'll take the successes that we have so far. I want to remind everyone, uh, we still have time for a few more questions from our audience. You can send questions by email to the Latin American program. That's LAP at WilsonCenter.org, LAP at WilsonCenter.org, or you can reach out to us on Twitter at LATAMPROG, that's L-A-T-A-M. P-R-O-G. We've got a question from the Associated Press. Michael, I'm going to start with you. The, so recently, the prosecutors of the International Narcotics and Terrorism Division in the Southern District of New York took the unusual step of dropping sanctions violation charges against an Iranian businessman after he'd already been found guilty. The judge overseeing the case reprimanded prosecutors for trying to, quote, bury exculpatory evidence that, was, that it was required to hand over to the defendant. My, the question here from the Associated Press is how do you feel this unusual set of events will impact other sanctions cases going forward, specifically against Venezuelans? And since sanctions are a tool primarily used by the United States, do you feel this is, it, it is a useful use of government resources to pursue what are relatively minor offenses, such as having real estate or a bank account in the US in violation of sanctions? Michael, I'll start with you, but Dan, I'd like you to weigh in as well. Uh, so I can't really talk about the SDNY case because I, I didn't have much involvement in that. My understanding is what they're asking about is the Emergency Powers Act, charging because someone's violated certain sanctions. Um, I think, as Walter talked about, the United States government has a lot of tools in its toolbox and the full being able to use those full, all of those tools is incredibly worthwhile. OFAC is an incredible hammer, especially when it comes to 
those countries that have a, a very strong financial tie to the United States, Mexico, Colombia. Venezuela has turned out to be a, a little more of an exception because they are saying in Venezuela, they don't have as much contact with US financial, US financial institutions. Um, I think when you're starting to look at people or assets that are in the United States that, the, that are the result or can be traced to direct proceeds, having the ability to take that away, take the toys away, is a, is a strong tool. I think it's one of many. If you're looking at corruption or money laundering, those are the other federal criminal charges. Um, it, it's hard to say specifically whether in every case it's a, it's a charge that you should rely on. If, if there is a charge, these people should be charged. You should be able to take away their proceeds and you should take away their proceeds. They shouldn't be allowed to deposit 10, five, 100, 100 million dollars in a US bank and sit here and allow it to be protected simply because at this point, there's no direct evidence for a, a different criminal charge, whether it's money laundering or corruption. If you have a violation of IEPA and someone violates one of these sanctions, then yeah, you should take it away from them. They shouldn't be able to skirt some of these criminal laws just because the investigation hasn't gotten up to speed to charge other things. Criminals have gotten sophisticated. Uh, they're using very high level, smart, educated financial managers who are hiding their money all over the world. And they're becoming as smart as we are. They are aware of those jurisdictions that the United States may not have a stronger relationship to be able to exchange information as quickly and easily. And it becomes a bit of a, a black hole for us at times. And money, once it goes in, where it goes to it, it's hard to pick up again. The Testafaro goes all the way back to the drug days. And even the sophisticated corruption, money launderers, white collar criminals have caught on to that. You put it in someone else's name, it's it's sometimes hard to trace. And similar question for you. You think we're striking the right balance with sanction violations cases? Yeah, I I do. I, I do. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I do, but but I to, to to answer the AP reporter's question though about whether that case, the one in the Southern District, I'm blank. It's in the Southern District of New York. Um, I'm blanking on the name of the defendant, but uh, I don't think that's going to affect criminal sanctions enforcement at all. Mainly because it's a that was really a discovery violation that the judge found by the government prosecutor. So it may make them more cautious in all cases, but I don't think it's going to be particularly uh, you know, focused on IEPA cases. Uh, that, you know, I won't bore you with the facts, but there was a case where a, a particular uh, OFAC decision had, had been held back from the defense, hadn't been given to the, to the defense, and the prosecutors you know, kind of snuck it into a group of documents they were giving in during the, the middle of the trial, and the judge didn't like that it, that it was, had, hadn't been turned over earlier. So you know, it's one of those discovery disputes that, hap that happens um, you know, but in terms of, of OFAC and sanctions, it's very, very important to U.S. national security. And, and remember that criminal sanctions cases require willfulness. So, you know, OFAC, OFAC uh, settled cases, you know, hundreds of times a year that don't require any mental state at all. There are strict liability cases against companies and banks and other financial institutions that might violate the letter of IEPA. But when it's done willfully, uh, I think that uh, that certainly does for the right size case, deserve criminal enforcement. And OFAC is, of course, the Office of Foreign Assets Control at the U.S. Treasury. IEPA, an authority that gives the president uh, the ability to impose some of the sanctions that we're describing. Just helping with the acronyms for some members of our audience who are not former government officials. Walter, I, I want to turn to you for a question about the DOJ's role in helping prosecutions that are taking place in elsewhere. You know, there are cases where, where governments can't or won't extradite. Um, there are cases where we have developed intelligence or information that could be useful. Um, I bring this up because a lot of the questions I'm getting are about what will happen to Cienfuegos in Mexico, whether the army has so much now um, authority there that AMLO is scared to pursue it, whether DOJ has any view even in this particular case as to whether he should be prosecuted. I just note that, that Dan mentioned earlier that the U.S. attorney has stood by all of the facts presented and the, the argument in the indictment, even though the indictment has been dropped for foreign policy reasons. Again, you don't have to weigh in on Cienfuegos, but the idea of the DOJ's role or interest in helping foreign prosecutions where we can play some, some useful part. I think DOJ has a strong interest in, in helping the foreign prosecutions. Uh, the question is whether those foreign 
systems are strong enough by themselves, even if helped by, by DOJ, uh, to be able to, to get the convictions. Um, a lot of the cases, a lot of these high profile cases that we've been talking about today um, are made using cooperating witnesses, people who have agreed to testify, to provide information. And in our US system, it's set up to allow those uh, kind of individuals to contribute to a conviction. Uh, we have safeguards in place um, about testifying, for example, under a pseudonym. We have safeguards in place about uh, what we can do to protect the, the family of a cooperating witness. Uh, anything from giving some assistance and, and money to, to relocate all the way to uh, the witness protection program. The, the problem is um, how do you guarantee those same kind of protections in a foreign jurisdiction uh, that's not used to cases built by cooperating witnesses? Um, and by the way, this, this is a problem that also happens in US prosecutions where you have a cooperating witness and you might be able to protect them and, and to bring, for example, the the husband and wife, maybe the two kids over, but uh, the rest of the family still remains in a foreign country and, and is subject to harm. Uh, it, it was, for example, something that, that happened in the Hernandez case in the Southern District of New York. Uh, among the evidence that they presented was a ledger from a cooperating witness. That was a cooperating just, witness. Just, sorry, just to clarify, this is the brother of President Juan Orlando Hernandez of Honduras. Go ahead. Correct. So that, that ledger uh, was presented in New York. Uh, that cooperating witness was actually uh, a defendant in the Southern District of Florida. However, he was pending extradition. And so at the time he was still in a Honduran jail awaiting extradition and he was killed uh, very graphically in, in recordings that are uh, circulating on, on the internet. Um, but it, it highlights the, the challenges that we have as US prosecutors sharing information with foreign counterparts and helping them to build that kind of case because their systems aren't always built in a way to accept the, the evidence from cooperating witnesses and protect them at the same time. And, and a lot of that, sorry, we'll get back to you with just two minutes left, but Walter, a lot of the tools that you're describing, I think were brought to bear in the Chapo Guzman case in terms of ways to protect witnesses, ways to use witness protection, you tell me. That, that's correct, they, they were. Um, but again, you're talking about a US prosecution. Uh, the situation uh, changes very dramatically. If Mexico had taken the position that they would like to prosecute Chapo Guzman in, in Mexico City, and they would like the US to turn over their evidence, uh, I think there are certainly pieces of evidence we, we could provide, but all these cases are very heavily reliant on cooperators and, and that's where it's the, the really the hardest thing with helping a foreign prosecution. What I was gonna say is this underscores what, what was animating the US global anti-corruption agenda from 2014 is that the US is taking it upon themselves to try to change things in other countries, not said explicitly, but un, un, underneath the surface is that the US doesn't have a lot of faith in a lot of the justice systems in other countries that they're gonna do it themselves. So with Cienfuegos, everyone's sort of waiting with bated breath to see whether Mexico prosecutes him or, or not. Michael, with just, just two minutes remaining, do you get a sense that the new administration will change at all the, the focus of U.S. attorneys on some of these cases, some of the categories we've described? Is this subject to you know, the kind of priorities at the White House? Or, or do you get a sense that just as DOJ pursued this aggressively, despite less interest in the Trump administration, it might do it indifferent to whatever we hear from a new Biden administration. I think, as Dan mentioned earlier, you may see certain focuses coming down from the White House related to what you saw from the Obama administration carrying over into the Biden administration. But in the types of cases that we've been talking about here, whether it's the transnational narcotics, the foreign corruption or money laundering, I think those will remain top priorities for the offices that choose to do them because there's a fundamental reason in the districts that they're happening, whether it's Brooklyn, Manhattan, Miami, DC, Texas, where there's a direct correlation to these crimes that even though maybe the one of the substantive or the main subject 
the bribery in a foreign country of a foreign official is occurring somewhere else, there's still a significant connection to those individual jurisdictions and a significant amount of money that these individuals are sending through the U.S. financial institution that will still make them a priority across the board. Walter, Michael, Dan, thank you so much for joining us. This has been an incredibly enriching conversation on, on critical issues, both you know how and why the Department of Justice pursues these cases with these international links, and you know the benefits to the rule of law and the criminal justice systems in our you know partner countries. I thank you so much for joining us. Thank you everyone who participated in this event and, and stay tuned for similar programming from the Latin American program at the Wilson Center. Again, Walter, Michael, Dan, thank you so much. Michael, again, thank you so much for your firm's generous sponsorship of this event. We hope that we also can collaborate again in the future. Looking forward to it. Thank you. Take care.